let's go to the basic building blocks of biology that I think is another angle at which you can start to understand the human mind, the human body, which is quite fascinating, which is from the basic building blocks, start to simulate, start to model how from those building blocks you can construct bigger and bigger, more complex systems, maybe one day the entirety of the human biology. So here's another problem that thought to be impossible to solve, which is protein folding. And AlphaFold, or a specific AlphaFold 2, uh, did just that. It solved protein folding. I think it's one of the biggest breakthroughs, uh, certainly in the history of structural biology, but uh, in general in, in science, um, maybe from a high level, what is it and how does it work? Mm -hmm. And then we can ask some fascinating sure. uh, questions after. Sure. Um, so maybe uh, to explain it uh, to people not familiar with protein folding is, you know, I, first of all, explain proteins, which is, you know, proteins are essential to all life. Every function in your body depends on proteins. Sometimes they're called the workhorses of biology. And if you look into them, and I've, you know, obviously as part of AlphaFold, I've been researching proteins and, and, and structural biology for the last few years. You know, they're amazing little bio nanomachines proteins. They're incredible. If you actually watch little videos of how they work, animations of how they work. And um, proteins are specified by their genetic sequence called their amino acid sequence. So you can think of it as their genetic uh, makeup. And then in the body, uh, in in nature, they when they when, when they fold up into a three D structure, so you can think of it as a string of beads, and then they fold up into a ball. Now the key thing is you want to know what that three D structure is, um, because the structure the three D structure of a protein uh, is what uh, helps to determine what does it do, the function it does in your body. Uh, and also, if you're interested in drug drugs or, or disease, you need to understand that three D structure because if you want to target something with a drug compound or about to block the, something the protein's doing, uh, you need to understand where it's going to bind on the surface of the protein. So obviously, for, in order to do that, you need to understand the 3D structure. So the structure is mapped to the function. The structure is mapped to the function, and the structure is obviously somehow specified by the by the amino acid sequence. And that's, the, in essence, the protein folding problem is, can you, just from the amino acid sequence, the one-dimensional uh, string of letters, can you uh, immediately computationally predict the 3D structure. Right. And this has been a, a grand challenge in biology for over 50 years. So I think it was first articulated by Christian Anfinsen, a Nobel Prize winner in 1972, uh, as part of his Nobel Prize winning lecture. And he just speculated this should be possible to go from the amino acid sequence to the 3D structure. But he didn't say how. So it was a, it, it, I, I, you know, I've been, it's been described to me as, as equivalent to Fermat's last theorem, yeah. but for biology. Right? You, you should, as somebody that uh, very well might win the Nobel Prize in the future, but outside of that, you, you should do more of that kind of thing. In the margin, just put random things yeah, right. that will exactly. take like 200 years to solve. <laughs> Set people off for 200 years. It should be possible. Exactly. And just don't give any details. Exactly. I think everyone, should, exactly. It should be, I'll, I'll have to remember that for future. So yeah, so he set off, you know, with this one throwaway remark, just like Fermat, you know, he he set off this whole 50-year uh, 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 field, really, of, of computational biology. And and they had you know they got stuck they hadn't really got very far with doing this and and um, until now until AlphaFold came along this is done experimentally right very painstakingly so the rule of thumb is and you have to like crystallize the protein which is really difficult some proteins can't be crystallized like membrane proteins and then you have to use very expensive electron microscopes or X-ray crystallography machines really painstaking work to get the 3D structure and visualize the 3D structure so the rule of thumb in 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 experimental biology is that it takes one PhD student their entire PhD to do one protein uh, and with AlphaFold 2, we're able to predict the 3D structure in a matter of seconds. Um, and so we were, you know, over Christmas, we did the whole human proteome or every protein in the human body, all 20,000 proteins. So the human proteome is like the equivalent of the human genome, but on protein space and, uh, and sort of revolutionized really what uh, 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 structural biologists can do. Because now um, they don't have to worry about these painstaking experimental, you know, should they put all of that effort in or not? They can almost just look up the structure of their proteins like a Google search. And so there's a data set on which it's trained and how to map this amino acid sequence. First of all, it's incredible that a protein, this little chemical computer is able to do that computation itself in yes. some kind of distributed way and do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's a weird thing. And they evolved that way because, you know, in the beginning, 
I mean, that's a great invention, just the protein itself. Of yes, Earth. I mean, and, th and then they, there's, I think, probably a, a history of, like, uh, they evolved uh, to have many of these proteins, and those proteins figure out how to be computers themselves in such a way that you can create structures that can interact in complex ways with each other in order to form high level functions. I mean, it's a weird system that they figured it out. Well, for sure. I mean, we, you know, maybe we should talk about the origins of life too, but proteins themselves, I think are magical and incredible, uh, 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 as I said, little, little bio nanomachines. And, um, and, and actually let Leventhal, who is another scientist, uh, uh, a contemporary of Amphinson, uh, he, he, he coined this Leventhal, what became known as Leventhal's paradox, which is exactly what you're saying. He calculated roughly a pro an average protein, which is maybe 2,000 amino acid uh, uh, bases long, is, um, is, is, can fold in maybe 10 to the power 300 different conformations. So there's 10 to the power 300 different ways that protein could fold up. And yet somehow in nature, physics solves this solves this in a matter of milliseconds so proteins fold up in your body in you know sometimes in in fractions of a, of a second mm -hmm. so ha physics is somehow solving that search problem and just to be clear yeah. in many of these cases maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong there's often a unique way for the sequence to form itself yes so among that huge number of possibilities yes it figures out a way how to stably uh in some cases, there might be a misfunction, mis so on, which leads to a lot of the disorders and stuff like that. But yes. most of the time, it's a unique mapping. And that unique mapping is not obvious. No, exactly. <laughs> which and, is and what the problem no, is. No, exactly. So there's a unique mapping, usually, uh, in a healthy, in, if, you, if it's healthy. And as you say, in disease, so for example, Alzheimer's, one, one, one conjecture is that it's because of a misfolded protein, a protein that folds in the wrong way, amyloid beta protein. So... Um, and then because it folds in the wrong way, it gets tangled up, right, in your in, in your neurons. So um, it's super important to understand both uh, healthy functioning and, and, and also disease is to understand, uh, you know, what, what these things are doing and how they're structuring. Of course, the next step is sometimes proteins change shape when they interact with something. So um, they're not just static necessarily in, in, in biology. Maybe you can give some interesting sort of beautiful things to you about these early days of AlphaFold, mm -hmm. of, of solving this problem, because unlike games, this is real physical systems that are less amenable to self-play type of mechanisms. Sure. Right? The, the size of the data set is smaller mm -hmm. than you might otherwise like, so you have to be very clever about certain things. Is there something you could speak to um, what was very hard to solve and what are some beautiful aspects about the, the solution? Yeah, I, I, I would say AlphaFold is the most complex and also probably most meaningful system we've built so far. So it, it's been an amazing time actually in the last you know two, three years to see that come through because um, as we talked about earlier, you know, games is what we started on, uh, building things like AlphaGo and AlphaZero. But really the ultimate goal was to, um, not just to crack games, it was just to, to, to build, use them to bootstrap general learning systems we could then apply to real world challenges. Specifically, my passion is scientific challenges like protein folding. And then AlphaFold, of course, is our first big proof point of that. And so, um, you know, in terms of the data, uh, and the amount of innovations that had to go into it, we, you know, it was like th more than 30 different component algorithms needed to be put together to crack the protein folding. Um, I think some of the big innovations were that um, kind of building in some hard coded constraints around physics and evolutionary biology um, to constrain sort of things like the bond angles uh, 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 in the in the in the protein and things like that. Um, a lot, but not to impact the learning system. So still allowing uh, the system to be able to learn the physics uh, itself um, from the examples that we had. And the examples, as you say, there are only about 150,000 proteins, even after 40 years of experimental biology, only around 150,000 proteins have been, the structures have been found out about. So that was our training set, which is um, much less than normally we would like to use. Um, but using various tricks, things like self-distillation, so actually using alpha fold predictions, um, some of the best predictions that it thought was highly confident in, we put them back into the training set, mm -hmm. right, to make the training set bigger. Um, that was critical to, to alpha fold working. So there was actually a huge number of different um, uh, innovations like that that were required to, to ultimately crack the problem. AlphaFold 1 
what it produced was a distogram. So uh, a kind of uh, a matrix of the pairwise distances between all of the molecules in the in the in the protein, and then there had to be a separate optimization process to uh, uh, create the three D structure. Uh, and what we did for AlphaFold two is make it truly end to end. So we went straight from the amino acid sequence of 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 uh, bases to uh, the 3D structure directly without going through this intermediate step. And in machine learning, what we've always found is that the more end to end you can make it, the better the system. And it's probably because um, we, you, you know, the, in the end, the system is better at learning what the constraints are than 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 we are as the human designers of specifying it. So anytime you can let it flow end to end and actually just generate what it is you're really looking for, in this case, the 3D structure, uh, you're better off than having this intermediate step, which you then have to hand craft the next step for. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's better to let the gradients and the learning flow all the way through the system um, from the end point, the end output you want to the inputs. So that's a good way to start on a new problem. Handcraft a bunch of stuff, add a bunch of manual constraints with a small end-to-end -end learning piece or a small learning piece and grow that learning piece until it consumes the whole thing. That's right. And so you can also see, you know, this is a bit of a method we've developed over doing many sort of successful alpha, so we call them alpha X projects, yeah. right? Is And the, the easiest way to see that is the evolution of AlphaGo to AlphaZero. So AlphaGo was um, a learning system, but it was specifically trained to only play Go. Right. So uh, and what we wanted to do in with the first version of AlphaGo is just get to world champion performance no matter how we did it. Right. And then and then of course AlphaGo Zero, we 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 remove the need to use human games as a starting point. Right. So it, it could just play against itself from random starting point from the beginning. So that removed the the need for human knowledge uh, about Go. And then finally Alpha Zero then generalized it so that any things we had in there, the system, including things like symmetry of the Go board, uh, were removed. So that Alpha Zero could play from scratch any two player game. And then Mu Zero, which is the final, our latest version of that set of things, was then extending it so that you didn't even have to give it the rules of the game. It would learn that for itself. So it could also deal with computer games as well as board games. So that line of AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, Alpha Zero, Mu Zero, that's the full trajectory of what you can take from uh, imitation learning to full self supervised learning. Yeah. Exactly, and learning learning uh, the entire structure of the environment you put in from yeah. scratch, right? And 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 bootstrapping it uh, through self play uh, yourself. But the thing is, it would have been impossible, I think, or very hard for us to build Alpha Zero or Mu Zero first out right. of the box, even so, psychologically, because you have to believe in yourself for a very long time. You're you're constantly dealing with doubt because yeah. a lot of people say that it's impossible. To, exactly. To so it was hard that. enough just to do Go, as you were saying, everyone thought that was impossible uh, or at least a decade away um, from when we when we did it in, back in 2015, 24, uh, you know, 2016. And, um, and so, yes, it would have been psychologically probably very difficult as well as the fact that, of course, we learned a lot by building AlphaGo first. Right, so it's. I think this is why I call AI an engineering science. It's one of the most fascinating science disciplines, but it's also an engineering science in the sense that, unlike natural sciences, um, the phenomenon you're studying doesn't exist out in nature. You have to build it first. So you have to build the artifact first, and then you can study how how uh, and pull it apart and how it works.